Here we go. And welcome to a live edition of the Scare of Scuttlebutt podcast teamed up with Mr. David Triana of Followers of the Force podcast. It is a pleasure to have you here with us. This is going to be a really great show, as they say on the television. How you doing, David? Let me get this banner off so we can see everybody. <laughs> I'm Hold doing on a pretty second good, here. Bro. How about you, man? Fantastic. Hold on a second awesome. here. Oh, there's there everybody. There we go. Mostly everybody. <laughs> Mostly everybody. Yeah, Brad, you got to get that camera fixed. Working on it. Because we, uh, we want to see your face. How is everybody? Doing great. That's fantastic. Fantastic. If I, uh, if I disappear, it's because uh, the storm's rolling through here. Uh, so we got some Camino type storms coming through the southeast. Oh, area. that's right. If I disappear, it's because I don't like you guys. <laughs> well, it is, but. Well, I mean, separate issues. Separate issues. Separate issues, yeah. It's good to be here with you guys. All right. Rob, how's it going with you? Going great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. This is a very interesting topic. Uh, David, thank you very much for spearheading this. This is uh, this is going to be another deep dive for us here at the Scare of Scuttlebutt podcast. It's one of our favorite things to do mm -hmm. um, besides, uh, you know, hanging out with people. But uh, this is going to be uh, fantastic. Um, we got some people in the chat who want to say hello to uh, our friends. Uh, in the chat. Oh, Pizza and Parsecs is here. How you guys doing? And uh, Cam Ray, you know, Cam was uh, late this time around. He was here only two hours uh, beforehand <laughs> instead of three like last time. So Cam, you gotta, you gotta step that up a little bit. So David, uh, what is going on? You've got uh, a couple of new shows coming up. You just wrapped up a couple of shows uh, that look uh, pretty pretty damn interesting and impressive. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, Followers of the Force. What's going on over on uh, in your neck of the woods? Yeah, so today we just finished recording our commentary for The Last Jedi. Um, that'll be up on Wednesday. Uh, and I have a, a slew of interviews coming up with some very, very interesting people. I don't want to give away... Uh, who they all are yet, um, but I will say I've already posted on Twitter, but tomorrow I will be speaking with uh, stop-motion animator, sculptor, director, visual effects supervisor Phil Tippett, who worked on the original trilogy, as well as Jurassic Park, uh, Starship Troopers, a bunch of other films. So that's going to be a very cool and exciting discussion, um, and those will be coming out kind of every week. Um, but the one that's going to be coming out this Friday is about an hour and 15 minute long interview with uh, Brian J. Jones, who wrote the biography on George Lucas called George Lucas, A Life. So I hope you guys listen to that because it was a lot of fun. And he's a really, really great guest. Um, had a lot of fun talking to him. Yeah, for sure. That, uh, as I was telling you in the chat, uh, kudos on, on that uh, ask. That's awesome. Yeah. Excellent. And Mr. Uh, Rob, um, how is Michigan? I know uh, I, I gave you a little break. You are no longer searching for 40th anniversary Empire Strikes Back uh, toys for me. So thank you very much for that. Well, that's not really true. I mean, I, I've been <laughs> I've been told that if there's any Imperials floating around out there, <laughs> that's true. Any dirty Imperials, uh, you got to grab me a couple. They're picking those up, and of course. Now that you're not looking for them anymore, there's probe droids everywhere uh, at the local Meyer. So yeah. So uh, we got my uh, co-host here also uh, from the Scare of Scuttlebutt podcast. I hear there is a, a storm a-brewing. What's going on down where you're at, Brad? Yeah, it's, uh, it's great to be on. Yeah, it, it's been kind of uh, the norm around here lately with these storms uh, popping up. I think it's going to be raining all week, um, but we'll take it. But uh, besides all the stuff that's going on in the world, you know, life is pretty good down here. I can't complain too much. That's good. That's good. Yeah, time with family. Uh, time with uh, regular family and Star Wars family. It's just uh, fantastic. It's fantastic. So, what do we got on our agenda today? Uh, we uh, are really excited to uh, talk about this topic. It is something that when I mentioned uh, to Brad 
Um, he was all giddy. Uh, he uh, definitely, uh, you know, I think we're all looking forward to it. Some of the folks in the chat are looking forward to, to it. And, uh, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's one of the types of shows that I really love getting into. Um, you know, the last one we did was, uh, Brad, if you remember, with Alex, we uh, talked about the uh, legacy of balance of the force. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those shows that, you know, we obviously having a podcast, we, we do news, uh, you know, weekly news or whatever is coming out. Uh, we analyze, you know, the TV shows and all the stuff that uh, that goes under that umbrella. But sometimes we want to kind of, you know, uh, give ourselves a little break from all that and then really just kind of, you know, use our brain and try to uh, uh, impress upon people that Star Wars is really more than just, you know, lightsabers and spaceships. We uh, like to kind of dive deep in... Uh, some of those elements and uh, this one is really uh, one of those times where we really get to see you know what this is all about uh, as far as uh, a philosophy standpoint as far as uh, you know a hero's journey and uh, what that all means um, I, I want to thank Brad uh, also too for uh, for coming up with some of our show notes today. They're very very complete, uh, very impressive. Um, thank you, Brad. And um, let's uh, let's get started right away. Um, I know you know Brad. This is one of the things that's close to your heart. You had sent everybody a um, a YouTube clip for us to kind of um, you know start uh, you know work in our brains with with this topic because it is quite a, a, an interesting one uh, maybe a topic that a lot of maybe some of our young listeners or younger listeners really don't know uh, about so uh, let's uh, let's start from day one uh, Brad tell us a little bit about what is this hero's journey that everybody talks about and who is uh, I was gonna say who is Bruce Campbell who <laughs> who is who is Joseph Campbell you know, uh, Bruce Campbell has his own hero's journey, but uh, that's <laughs> not appropriate for all audiences, so uh, we won't do that here. Um, but he does follow it. But uh, anyway, uh, one of the greatest uh, uh, mythologists uh, of the 20th century, a uh, man by the name of Joseph Campbell, uh, Professor Joseph Campbell, he studied mythology. He started with uh, his favorite was Native American mythology. Um, and... Uh, he learned that that's how they lived their lives. They lived by these myths. Uh, he branched out into other forms of mythology, uh, uh, the mythology of the Middle Ages, King Arthur, but also, of course, uh, Greek mythology, all the gods and goddesses. And as he studied these different mythological stories, what he came to understand was each hero followed a certain path as they went along in their adventures. And uh, this became known as the hero's journey and uh, as you said we posted the video uh, about it and it comes in stages um, from the very beginnings and we'll get into the details on how this applies to Star Wars but it's the uh, complete loop uh, of, of a hero in any type of story whether it be uh, literature or in a movie and uh, once you understand the hero's journey once you embrace it you know there I can't watch and I'm sure you guys are probably the same way I can't watch a movie now without identifying each uh, step in the hero's journey, where they are in their path, and uh, like, oh, there, there's the, there's the wizard archetype. Uh, here's the uh, call to adventure. Here's the refusal of the call. You know, I have a hard time watching a movie now without uh, seeing it from the point of view of the hero's journey, and it makes Star Wars make a lot more sense to you once you do understand the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, uh, David, one of the things that you had posted early on was um, I know there was a the the book that I have is um, not the book that you posted. The there was a, the other book um, by uh, Joseph Campbell. But tell me a little bit about the book that you posted. The title, the man with what was it? The man with uh, the hero with a thousand faces. Yeah, um, and you know I'll be the first to say I am not an expert by any means on Joseph Campbell. Um, I really got into this. Honestly, last week watching the uh, Empire of Dreams documentary again, and then mentioning Joseph Campbell and reading the George Lucas biography, um, so then I became interested in seeing you know there's all this uh, talk on Twitter about you know whether or not 
uh, for example, Ray, did she follow her heroine's journey? And then, you know, going back to Luke's story and all these other uh, movies and and books where these characters all follow this similar path. And I was just interested to see where this all came from. Um, and I'm glad Brad is here since, you know, he, he obviously uh, cares a lot about this subject and I'm really, really eager to learn more. Um, so that's, I'm here more of a, a, as a student than, than anything else tonight. And speaking of student, you know, Joseph Campbell, uh, you know, being one of the great, uh, you know, storytellers and, and mythologists, as Rob said, you know, he had uh, called George Lucas one of his greatest students. And I find that a very fascinating thing. Um, Rob, do you know a little bit about uh, myth in Star Wars? Yeah, um, certainly they bring it up in the making of the original Star Wars film. Uh, it's talked about quite a bit. And the fact that um, you know they, they call it a monomyth, really, uh, because it is this pattern that just seems to creep up over and over and over throughout mythology. Uh, all different types, all different places around the world seem to have these components. And uh, you know, really, what happened was Lucas was really struggling to get his script together for the initial Star Wars film. He, I believe, gone through two drafts um, and, and was just kind of having a hard time pulling the story together. And he had stumbled across Joseph Campbell, uh, Joseph Campbell, and uh, the Hero with a Thousand Faces, and all of a sudden, that is really kind of what what uh, lit the light bulb in his head and inspired him to kind of restructure the story that he wanted to tell into something that would line up with that that kind of classic monomyth. And uh, that's why I think, especially the original Star Wars film, uh, fits that so so neatly. And um, there were some other kind of cool things we'll get into, I think, as we get into this a little bit deeper. Yeah, Brad, you had mentioned uh, you had a short list when you were talking about how you uh, can no longer watch a movie without kind of picking apart and dissecting the certain uh, aspects of the hero's journey in, in, in our discussion. Um, what were some of the initial or, or what are the some of the first parts of a hero's journey? Um, obviously, when we see movies like, you know, Star Wars or see, you know, even the, the the movies that are definitely a hero's journey, uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, you know, movies like that. What are some of the types that you look for that are familiar to you as far as a hero's journey? Uh, you mean like the the steps of, or the phases of, of the journey? Yeah, right? yeah. Let's let's start with some of the early ones. Like, what makes it? Uh, you know, why is it so special? It, it shows how the. Um, you know, there's there's an old saying, you can never go home again. Uh, and it, it applies here. There, uh, It shows the evolution of the hero, and it explains why things have to happen in, in a movie or in a story um, for the hero to fully uh, meet their potential. Um, you know, all heroes, you know, you can take this, you know, The Matrix is, is another one that, at least the first Matrix movie, uh, completely follows the the hero's journey as well. You know, they all start off with the ordinary world, whether that be in you know, the office building in the case of, of the Matrix or uh, a farm on, on Tatooine. They all start uh, in just an ordinary world. And, you know, and the reason why it's so important is it, people can relate to that. Um, people, people understand the ordinary world. Um, and that puts in perspective and that, so you can find common ground with the hero from the very beginning. Um, and it really, you know, why, you know, it, it answers questions like, why does the teacher have to die? Why does the teacher always go away in one way or another? Uh, I just got done with the Mistborn series. I don't know if you guys have uh, read that or not. You know, the, they follow the same hero's journey in that, you know. And, uh, so it helps you to relate to the hero and it makes their, these grand adventures that they go on, it makes them digestible so you can fully understand it. Uh, now, is uh, are these aspects of the hero's journey, are they um, similar in all movies or all narratives of this scope? Tell me a little bit about the commonalities of it. Uh, they, they're 90, I would say at least 90% similar. If you have a story with a hero as the protagonist, they are going to be 90% similar. Um, now they'll branch off a little bit and these don't necessarily need to be in the same uh, order uh, in each movie, um, but they're going to be mostly similar. They're going to follow mostly the same pattern 
And what you'll see in these movies is these patterns uh, repeat themselves. They'll repeat themselves repeatedly throughout the movie. And if you have a, a multiple movies, uh, they will repeat themselves throughout the arc. You saw there was a he hero's journey for Luke and A New Hope, and then he repeats the process uh, in Empire Strikes Back as well as Return of the Jedi. It's just he's in a different, uh, at a different level of his evolution. As you, and that's how you go from you know being a Padawan up to a Jedi Master is this repetition of the hero's journey. You never go back to the same level that you were before. It's impossible. Uh, if you do, if the character does, that means the story is broken uh, somehow. Uh, hmm. And so if a movie seems disjointed to you, that could be because it's not exactly following uh, this pattern, this uh, arc of the hero's journey. Now, that's interesting because a lot of people, um, you know, they're not really familiar with uh, the advent of the hero's journey, especially with the Joseph Campbell mythology and how that plays into Star Wars. So are you saying that this is somehow a, uh, I don't know, a subconscious or a subliminal um, creation of, of how to tell a story? And, and then that's why we pick it up as, as disjointed? Yeah, so the, the hero, like Joseph Campbell did not create the hero's journey he codified the hero's journey the hero's journey was always there right uh you will always have the different archetypes of these grand stories and we'll get into some of those archetypes here uh shortly uh, you always have those archetypes you will always have these different uh phases of the journey um and this spans different mythologies whether it's the native american mythology or the greek mythology roman mythology uh, or any of the other uh mythologies uh, they will all generally follow this pattern. Joseph Campbell was the one to best put it into words. Uh, you know, uh, Rob and David both uh, mentioned uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces. Um, I'll be honest with you, that's not a very exciting read, uh, especially the first part. Um, it, he gets into, uh, he loves the story of the Buddha, and uh, he'll, he'll tell that story over and over again, uh, both in the books as well as his uh, lectures that he's done. Um, it's not exciting reading, but he does lay it out perfectly. And when George Lucas picked up that book is when he had that aha, that eureka moment. Because if you read some of these early scripts that George had uh, around 1975, I'm going to use the word cringeworthy. Uh, they were a bit cringeworthy, and I'm glad those were not the final product because in 1977 that movie would have bombed and we would have never heard of uh, Star Wars had he done that. But he picked this up and it immediately resonated with him. And that's how he was able to, uh, you know, mold his story to meet that uh, that arc uh, for Luke and as well as for the other characters. It's important to remember that these the hero's journey is not just for the main protagonist. Every character will go through this, uh, at least the major characters will go through this throughout the story. So it's not it's not a Joseph Campbell original, uh, but he is the one that best put it into words. Uh, and I highly recommend, you know, some, from time to time, he'll pop up on Netflix uh, mm. or Amazon, his old lectures that he did uh, at some of the colleges. And if just if you search for Joseph Campbell and there's a video there, make sure you watch it and uh, it'll all make sense. Pretty, pretty good. Yeah, those are uh, interesting points. You know, we got uh, uh, quite a few people in the chat. I uh, want to welcome everybody. And uh, if you are not familiar with our panel tonight, uh, please look them up and uh, follow and subscribe to their content. Uh, we are here at the Scare of Scuttlebutt podcast. So uh, a couple of comments have made the, um, the, the screen here. Um, earlier we had uh, Frank and Amy. Uh, Frank was talking about how uh, the uh, reality of Luke's uh, life utterly exploded once his journey began. His life was to be transformed forever. And uh, obviously that is the very beginning of a hero's journey. We've got Charlie Skywalker on screen right now. Can a female embody the hero role or is that a completely separate thing? Now, um, Brad, you were talking about how every character... Um, embodies that uh, hero's role when they start on that journey. Um, so I, I, I would venture to say that it's, it's not like a, um, a female-male thing. It's, it's whatever character, whatever main character uh, comes into play. Uh, but, Rob, you were, you know, w we had discussions uh, a while back, and every time we seem to get together, we, we start talking about um, 
you know, Anakin's female role models. Um, you know, you've got Shmi, obviously. You've got Ahsoka. Um, you've got uh, folks, uh, female characters in, in Star Wars that really uh, go through some, some major change. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the female roles as far as uh, a hero's journey going through that with them? Um, I, I don't know that I would necessarily say that with Ahsoka, um, Padme, and Shmi, I, I don't really think of them in terms of the hero's journey, I guess, when I think of Anakin. I just really think of them as being um, you know, the three critical women in his life and the, the ones that kind of wanted or that, that inspired him to be the best person that he could be, the best Jedi he could be. Uh, and kind of as they got stripped away, that, that was kind of what led to his fall. Um, and, you know, Anakin's an interesting situation because uh, you have to look a lot wider scope than just a single film or even a single trilogy to to get closer to where you see a, a full, complete arc of his hero's journey. Um, you certainly see the, his rise to uh, you know to the heights of his Jedi abilities within the Clone Wars. Um, and that's where, you know, you see the, the three of them impacting him the most. But um, his fall is pretty precipitous, and, and he ends up kind of being more an anti-hero than a hero. Hey, Ro, can I uh, hop in on the, the, uh, the female characters? Sure, yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it goes, uh, so back to the, um, what Charlie was asking, yeah, hero, you know, that's in quotes, and that is a gender-neutral term. Um, most of what Joseph Campbell referred to was Greek mythology, and most of the heroes were male, uh, so that's why he kind of uses that term. But yes, hero refers to male or female, and we'll talk about Ray here in a little bit. But uh, as far as the you know the female characters, like you mentioned, Shmi, um, and this didn't make the show notes, but we can uh, add it later. It, it, that's the mother and the father figures in these mythological stories, whereas the the father figure. Either the hero's got uh, something to prove to the father figure, or the father is judgmental, or the father is a cause of some sort of angst uh, to the character. And that's why you see, like, I hate to call it daddy issues, right? But Luke's got some serious daddy issues uh, with, uh, with his father. Uh, the, the mother, on the other hand, is the nurturing one. So you see that with Shmi. Uh, you see that with Amperu in the original trilogy. Uh, they are the... Uh, the nurturing type. Uh, mothers give life, um, both uh, you know, figuratively and uh, physically. So you'll find that they're the nurturing ones. So that's why it hits so hard to Anakin, is because he lost that. His mother was the only one he ever had. So when he lost her, that was a huge cause uh, of anger and sadness for him. And, you know, this was something that was missing from Ray's life. Uh, Ray didn't have uh, a mother figure necessarily, so that's why her journey is a little bit different than what uh, Luke's was or what Anakin's was. So, uh, David, I wanted to ask you, you know, when you uh, watch a movie, obviously, you know, these are some things that are your, your, that we're all familiar with, especially coming from this, this uh, universe. Um, what are some of the archetypes that you notice when you watch a movie, uh, just kind of right off the bat? like? Um, for me, I like when I see a movie. I, I see it with uh, many different eyes and different perspectives. First, I um, absorb it, you know, um, on the surface level, and then my technical eye comes in and and I kind of uh, pinpoint like where the cameras are and how the lighting is and all the back background stuff. But when you watch a movie and you're looking for these archetypes, what are the some what are some of the things that you notice that surprise you? Um. Yeah, that's kind of a difficult question because obviously Star Wars is the one thing that we all have in common and it's kind of that formula that we're used to. Um, but looking at these different archetypes here that are in the notes, for whatever reason, the mentor role is the one that always stands out to me uh, when I watch a movie. Um, I don't know why, but I feel like it's always like, you know, an, an older character, one that's just been around a while. And Obi-Wan is the perfect example. Um, he's already spoken of in kind of like a mysterious kind of way like oh old ben is out beyond the dune sea and and he's uh, some old hermit out there and then when you see him he's like this wise jedi and as he gives you the whole backstory of everything and then we see in the force awakens han assumes that role 
Um, if we go outside Star Wars and Harry Potter, you know, to Harry, it's kind of, you know, Dumbledore is uh, his sort of mentor in those films as well as, you know, Hagrid and, and people like that. But yeah, for whatever reason, the mentor role um, is the one that always stands out to me. Um, I'm curious to know, what about you guys? Rob? All right, I was just responding to something in the chat. Uh, Charlie triggered me a little bit with his uh, Star Wars and no strong female characters, which drives me absolutely bonkers every time I see something like that get mentioned. Um, with regards to the archetypes, I, I agree with David. I think that uh, certainly the mentor uh, is the one that jumps out, and it's usually because generally you don't get a lot of time with that mentor character. Um, and, and they they are the one that is the holder of the knowledge, right? They're the the one who has mastered it. They're kind of the lens through which you kind of are able to view what the hero might be when they reach their full potential. Right. Um, so that's always interesting. You know, I, I think we all immediately uh, identify who the hero and the and the villain is, and those are pretty standard roles. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's not one of the primary archetypes; it's kind of one of the sub archetypes. But you know, the trickster character. Mm -hmm. um, that I always equate to, to R2 uh, in the original trilogy. I mean, he's just he's just the uh, the sassy kind of funny comic relief character, uh, and and 3PO to a lesser extent. Um, but you know, 3PO is really there more to to kind of be the person telling the story, driving. Uh, you know, he and R2 together really are the ones that are the, the common thread that runs through all the films. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely the mentor, and, and definitely seeing um, not only how they inspire the hero, but how that loss of the mentor then impacts the hero later on. And really, that's I think you know going back to the talk about Ray, that's one of the interesting things about the sequel trilogy. And I think one of the reasons that this archetype exists is because this is kind of how how storytelling is driven at its at its core. And one of the things I think a lot of people struggled with in the sequel trilogy was the fact that Rey had very few setbacks in terms of her journey. Uh, she gained her power very quickly. Uh, a lot of things that should have taken a long time to achieve were fairly effortless for her. And so in some ways it didn't really align with, with some of the struggles you expect to see your hero go through. And I think that people, uh, people recognize that even if it's subconsciously. Um, and it and it creates a little bit of a, a disconnect. Yeah, I wanted to ask you guys. You know, um, now when we see movies, and obviously because Star Wars is such a benchmark in our lives, you know, when we see like movies now, we always like, oh, no, that's the Ben Kenobi type. Oh, there's the Han Solo Rogue type. Um, it's funny because obviously these constructs were not started with Star Wars. You know, they're you know the, the these types of archetypes and stories go back you know a long time but uh, obviously because of our love for star wars we recognize them more and i think uh you know f from a fan perspective that kind of helps us kind of you know dissect these characters and those concepts in in real life um let's talk a little bit about what what is a hero usually a hero doesn't know he's a hero or or, or even better doesn't even want to be a hero um Brad, can you talk a little bit about the reluctant hero or the reluctant character in these films? Why are they so special? Yeah, so there's a good quote from uh, Joseph Campbell. A hero is someone who has given his or her life to something bigger than oneself. Right? That's where it culminates. That's how it, you know, that's how uh, that's the climax of the movie. But uh, you know, a hero, it, like you said, is always reluctant. They are the ones, you know, you don't want the ones that want power, right? That's your Palpatine type character, right? Uh, that's your Snoke type character. The ones that want power are the ones you have to be worried about. The ones that are initially, you know, repulsed or repelled by the power, those are the ones that end up being a hero. So in all of these um, stories, they start off in the ordinary world. There's a call to adventure. But the hero will always refuse that call to adventure. They don't want to go down to this this path. They, you know, human beings want to take, you know, I would say in most cases, want to take the path of least resistance. You know, we want to take, we want to have life 
to be easy for us. You know, that's what we want. Mm. Um, we don't necessarily want challenge, right? Some people seek it out, obviously. Um, but, you know, day to day, you want your life to be easy. So, you know, if you have some uh, creepy old man telling you that you need to fly uh, halfway across the galaxy uh, to go drop drop off a robot, uh, that you, you're probably not going to jump all over that one. That's not what you're used to, right? If you're a, a farmer, you've been raised as a farmer, and someone tells you you need to get on a spaceship and go on this adventure, you're going to be like, what? Uh, uh, no, hard pass on that. Uh, thank you for the offer. Right. Uh, the, the story wouldn't make any sense if they just jumped right on uh, this opportunity that's been presented before them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, with Luke, with the with the droids um, and meeting Obi-Wan, he refused the call. Then I can't I can't go. You know, uh, I'm already late as it is. You know, my uncle's expecting me back. Uh, you know, this we will talk about Ray. It happened with her. You know, she um, she was kind of reluctant. Yeah. She, she, her story is different, but you know when, you know in Maz Kanata's castle, uh, and she touched that lightsaber and had all the visions, um, and Maz is like, hey, this is yours. You're 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 going to be a hero now. She's like, I don't, I'm not touching that thing ever again. Uh, that's that's not for me, right? Mm-hmm. So that was her refusal of the call. So it happened at a different part in the movie, um, but you know, they the hero, the true hero, will be reluctant. And as we said before, this is a uh, repeating process. So this refusal of the call, it happens multiple times. Even in Return of the Jedi, uh, where uh, Obi-Wan in his Obi-Wan fashion says, hey, you have to go kill your dad now. And Luke says, I can't, I can't kill my father. And uh, of course, Obi-Wan just guilt, guilt trips him. Well, I guess the Emperor's already won, because um, that's what he does. Um, so he, once again, he refuses to call but then he goes through that roadblock. So what Rob was saying about uh, Ray's journey, the hero's journey is all about roadblocks. The entire thing should be filled with roadblocks and whether they have to go around them, underneath them, climb their way up over them, you know, bust their way through them, however they have to get around this roadblock, they, this roadblock needs to be there for them to evolve. So you, under, you, you can understand why these movies feel different to some people because those roadblocks are missing. You have to earn this title of hero. Um, and I personally, and I've said this many times, I, l- I like the character of Ray. I, th- I think she's a cool character. But it, you know, it resonates differently with people uh, and not well with some people because a lot of those roadblocks were just not presented. And, it's not, and that's not her fault as a character. Um, that's, you know, that's all about the writing and, and directing of the movie. She was just not presented with these roadblocks. They were just, you know, this is one of those uh, Lady in the Lake type deals where she was just handed Excalibur and she didn't have to do anything for it. She w- it was just given to her and made her ultra powerful. Um, so you want to have those roadblocks there and you want to have them say, no, uh, that wall's too high. I'm not going to be able to climb that one. Um, and that's what makes the story feel real and relatable to the, to the viewer. Yeah, we got a comment. Uh, Mr. Dale says uh, that he sees Ray's struggle happening before the movie even starts, and I mean, I can see that. Uh, but uh, David, you and I, we we had uh, mentioned a while ago a couple of instances where right. it see it it does seem like the most interesting stuff is happening not in the movie. Um, novels, comic books, before the movie, after the movie, in between the movie, and it's like. All right, come on, guys. What, what's going on? So, uh, tell me a little bit about. Um, we're going we're to talk about Ray uh, a, a little more in depth in depth in a little while. But uh, talk about. Um, let's talk about some of the mentors for these uh, heroes. Uh, David, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Obi Wan Kenobi, and obviously he is probably um, the. Uh, the first and foremost uh, of our um, our uh, mentors talk a little bit about their roles in in these films. You've got uh, seems like we have mentors. Um, everybody's got a mentor. You know, we're, we're all we're all Padawans. Uh, Qui Gon, uh, you know, Obi Wan. I mean, what about what's up with these mentors? Well, if we look at Obi Wan in in New Hope, you know, he's he's looking from a distance. He he knows what Luke's destiny is. 
but he really can't interfere in that until the time is right. And then once, you know, um, Luke goes back to uh, the homestead with, with Obi-Wan and he tells him all about his father, tells him about the Clone Wars, tells him about the Jedi, and then he's telling him, you know, learn about the Force. You know, you have no idea where it is that you come from. Um, and then obviously there's that the, the refuse to call, and then ultimately Luke is thrusted into it with the death of uh, Owen and Beru, and you know, there's nothing for me here now. I want to learn the ways of the Force and become a Jedi like my father. And then from then on, Obi Wan's just like, all right, you know, we finally I got him, and now we can really realize uh, Luke's destiny in all of this. Uh, and then if we go to Empire, it's Yoda. And already Yoda's testing Luke. Um, in that our initial meeting, he's, he's testing his, his patience, his, um, his anger, and then, you know, in the hut, and he's like, I, I can't teach him. He's, he's too much of a hothead. And then we learn later, Yoda never even wanted to train Luke um, initially. It was he wanted to train Leia because she had that level-headed um, personality. She already knew how to deal um, with those emotions being in the Senate and um, and we lose the Yoda mentor in Return of the Jedi, still have you know, Force with Obi-Wan, but all of these mentors are kind of trying to steer the hero in the what they see as the right direction. Um, so much so is Han offering you know, Rey a job in The Force Awakens. Um, but yeah, you know, they, they all have not each one has like a similar um, motivation. Um, some have to be, you know, kind of nudged into uh, into what they really uh, are aiming to do. But yeah, you know, the the mentors in, in these movies. Um, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of of how Luke operated in um, in the Last Jedi because it just felt it, it was a struggle that I think a lot of people could identify with. Um, what happens when you probably had, you know, 25 years of success and then one, one thing could just tear that all down? And, and how then do you build somebody up who has that same raw power that destroyed everything you had? So I think those stories are very, very cool when it comes to the mentor um, in these films. Yeah, for sure, for sure. You know, that uh, goes with uh, a discussion we'll have, uh, we'll continue to have about, uh, you know, the progression of a character, um, whether you think that character is uh, true to form or not, you know, uh, even in real life. Um, you know, a lot of people say people don't change, but, uh, you know, they do change to some degree, and I think it's uh, a very exciting prospect, uh, especially with characters that we've uh, lived with for decades here so uh very interesting what about um hey, hey, Ro, uh, yeah charlie just uh, commented about mentors being uh, coming in all shapes and sizes and talking for sure about droids. uh that's true and just so everybody knows um the the droids uh specifically r2d2 and the r2d2 and c3po they filled the role of the uh omniscient uh, narrator they were always supposed to be the ones uh the entire saga is from their perspective. That was, I'm not sure how many people knew that, but you know, the whole mm -hmm. thing, that's why R2's memory was never wiped. Poor C-3PO, he had his uh, memory wiped a couple times because he couldn't keep his mouth shut. Um, but the, the whole thing is from their perspective. So from a mythological standpoint, they are the omniscient. If you had to read uh, um, you know, any Shakespeare or even the, the old Greek mythology, they, they were the chorus that would come in and uh, get you from one step to the next. That's the role that R2-D2 and C-3PO were supposed to play in the movies. But they do uh, obviously act as mentors as well. And that goes back from uh, George Lucas's love of the uh, Kurosawa films. Um, the, uh, somebody reminded me of the film uh, The Hidden Fortress. And uh, the characters uh, at the beginning of that film, um, they were kind of modeled after... Uh, or R2 and 3PO were kind of modeled after those uh, characters, the two um, characters in the, the beginning of that film. But, uh, yeah, mentors, uh, you know, definitely are part of the staple when it comes to fantasy films. Uh, again, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, obviously. Um, but uh, let's talk about the uh, friends and allies that uh, these 
reluctant heroes end up having. Um, you know, we've got uh, a lot of allies in the Force. We've got uh, Han Solo. We've got uh, Finn. But, um, Rob, you want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the friends that kind of, uh, you know, help guide these her heroes. And they do it unwillingly. I mean, you know, even Han Solo had quite a uh, transformation of character from, um, you know, space pirate to, uh, you know, rebel leader uh, in his life. Um, let's talk about allies and friends of, of these heroes. Rob? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it goes back to what Brad was talking about earlier, that it's not just the hero that goes through a change over the course of this journey. It can be uh, some of these supporting characters as well. And I think Han Solo, that you just mentioned, was an excellent example. Um, you know, he kind of undergoes a hero's journey of his own, where he goes from being a, a smuggler just out for himself to someone who became a hero of the rebellion right alongside Luke. Um Certainly, Luke couldn't have succeeded within the original film without Han Solo and, and Chewbacca coming in there at the last minute to pick Vader off his tail. Um, so, you know, certainly those allies are, are huge. We see uh, some similarities as well. Um, really, I think in, especially in the sequel trilogy, more with Finn initially. Um, but again, you know, Finn, Finn has Poe, uh, Poe has Finn. Um, you end up kind of getting cross-pollination of these allies between each other and kind of supporting each other's journeys through this as well. Yeah, definitely. You know, support uh, of their journey is, um, you know, a very, um, very important thing when it comes to their growth. I think, uh, again, just even in, in, in real life, we uh, are influenced by the people around us. And uh, that uh, obviously is a double-edged sword, but it depends on our personal choices. We'll talk a little bit about the hero's journey in real life as we uh, go through the evening, because I think that's a very interesting topic, too. Um, Brad, did you want to have uh, uh, anything to add on the uh, friendships made through this hero's journey? Yeah, if, if you want to think about this, uh, and I want to thank Frank and Andy for the comment. I appreciate that. Um, if you want to think there, you know, the hero is on a upward trajectory the entire time throughout, but uh, it's not a linear path that they're following. So just think about a, a, you know, an upward angle that they're going on as, you know, as they go through their ascension, but it's more of a sine wave uh, going, you know, back and forth on either side of that line as they go up. And this is where you get the juxtaposition of the, allies that they have and on the other side you have the tricksters that we talked about and you have the shapeshifters and their story is going back and forth between these these two characters and the um them being competing with each other is what uh pushes the story along um you know we talked about the trickster the trickster is probably my favorite uh, archetype as well but also the shapeshifter um that's one of those classic archetypes as well as the shapeshifter and uh, doesn't mean a, a physical shapeshifter like you might have in some science fiction, but somebody who changes their personality depending on what the story requires uh, yeah. or what the protagonist uh, requires in their story. Uh, biggest example being Lando Calrissian in uh, Empire Strikes Back um, and Return of the Jedi. And, of course, you see him much later in his evolution uh, in The Rise of Skywalker. But, it, you know, in Empire Strikes Back, you know, he seems like a suave character at first when you meet him, a uh, really cool guy. But then he betrays uh, the heroes. Everybody looks at him as a villain. I, I actually beg to differ on that. He's got a whole city that he has to think about. Uh, you know, put yourself in his shoes. Um, you know, you're about to be under Imperial uh, blockade uh, or uh, they're going to leave a garrison there. You got to do what you got to do. But, of course, you see this whole thing from the hero's perspective. So he comes off as a villain. Well, he's really not. I mean, he goes, you know, as soon as they resolve that, he immediately helps them uh, get Han back from Jabba, and then he becomes one of the heroes of the Rebellion at the end of Return of the Jedi. So he is a ship shapeshifter. He does what he has to do uh, to make the story progress. So it's not without these allies, uh, tricksters, and shapeshifters uh, that the, the movie will progress. You have to have them uh, for the story to continue. Can I just interject one quick thing? Um, 
in the I, I'm not disagreeing completely with what Brad was saying. It's just that I, it's not a straight linear upward path that the hero goes on. There's a couple points typically where there's setbacks or interruptions, I guess, to that to that upward path. And uh, the thing that the like the best explanation I ever heard of that was the fact that. Uh, David W. Collins, when he used to do Star Wars Oxygen with Rebel Force Radio, he was talking about the fact that, in fact, Luke's theme, which is the main theme of Star Wars, is actually, if you chart it out on musical paper, it reflects the hero's journey almost exactly. It it goes, uh, you know, da, 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 da. So you hit that first mark where they, they start their journey upwards and then they kind of have their initial setback then it goes up again and the mentor dies and they have another setback and then it goes all the way up to their highest point and then it descends so john williams actually mirrored or or constructed luke's theme to mirror the hero's journey uh and it's just one of the many reasons that i think john williams is such a genius in terms of the music that he wrote especially for star wars is that he puts so much hidden meaning just in the music itself and the way he constructs that uh, and it very much harkens back to Joseph Campbell and his influences on George Lucas, uh, and having that stuff get exposed, uh, you know, by David W. Cullen, both through that series of podcasts as well as the soundtrack show that I know several of us now listen to uh, very regularly is is just that extra layer. It's like what uh, Brad talks about, where you watch a film and you can't help but see the hero's journey in it once you start listening to the music and the things that they're doing with the music to impact the way you watch the film, you see the film or hear the film uh, kind of through a, an entire different uh, level, I guess. Uh, and it's just uh, it's a really cool impact. Yeah, I guess that's what I meant by the uh, sine wave, but you explained it much better. So thank you for yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, one of the things that I remember hearing, and I can't remember who said it, if it was George Lucas or somebody else, but I remember... Uh, an old interview talking about how, you know, if you turn the sound down, that Star Wars really was designed to be a silent film. And uh, obviously with old silent films, you had the music, you had the stuff that's happening. But um, Rob, yeah, kudos, because, uh, you know, if you listen to a lot of the John Williams uh, music, even without the dialogue, you can really tell what's going on by the, char the character themes, uh, the notes, the way they are juxtaposed, you know, you've got some subtle, um, you know, musical sentences that um, probably play to your emotions a lot more than anything else that's going on in the movie. And I think that's, uh, again, like you said, that is really the power of John Williams' master uh, master stroke when it comes to uh, music composition. Um, you know, you and I, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, this weekend's um, uh, Clone Wars and how there were certain little notes in there that uh, I wasn't sure if you were imagining things because of, you know, that's probably your fourth drink. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe he's just a little cuckoo up there. But but I, I watched it uh, again, you know, tonight, and we, we can mention what it is later on, but uh, it, it's a fascinating, it's really, really a cool thing. And you, that's one of the things that you really have to pay attention to, because if you don't, I think you're missing half the story. Mm. So, you know, talking about tricksters, you know, you talked about um, the hero's journey that's a little sketchy it kind of you know goes back and forth or up and down you know you've got characters like loki where uh, in the avengers series where you know he's he's there really to kind of uh, trip up our heroes um these are stumbling blocks like you said uh that make that <clears throat> make our heroes kind of uh, you know make a left turn instead of a right and, and kind of adjust um we we do see a lot of that in star wars um I'm not sure how much of it we see in some of the newer films, um, but uh, what what is the role of the trickster per se? I mean, you know, you guys talked about uh, shapeshifters, and Brad, that was a really great example of how you know, again, not a physical shapeshifter, but somebody who kind of changes their mind halfway through and. That would be kind of like their own uh, hero's journey, but uh, it's, it's a little less black and white when it comes to these characters because of their complexity. Yeah, uh, I guess if I could say it in two words, curveballs. 
right? The the trickster is there to throw curveballs at the hero and, and the, the allies of the hero the entire time. Um, Loki, obviously, being the biggest example of the trickster in, in any mythology. Just when Thor thought, you know, he was doing the right thing, yet again, he, he was betraying him in some way, shape, yeah. or fashion. Uh, or he really wasn't physically there at all. Right? He's the he is the archetype uh, of the trickster. Um, but you know, people don't like to admit it, but the trickster in the prequel trilogy, believe it or not, is Jar Jar Binks. Um, the trickster not only are they supposed to throw curveballs at the uh, hero in the uh, the band of brothers there, as it were, uh, but also they're supposed to be the comedic relief as well. Now, how well George pulled that off with Jar Jar? Well, I mean, I'm not sure how much debate that's up for, but. Uh, you know, Are you kidding? Hit Jar Jar's hilarious. Well, I mean, I, I yeah, okay. Darth um, <laughs> Darth Jar Jar, please. Darth Jar Jar. So, like, he's the trickster. He throws a curveball. He's the one. I mean, he's he's the fall of the old republic. Uh, he's the one that votes to you know they they fool him into uh, getting the Senate to uh, That's vote true. to give the uh, Chancellor emergency uh, war powers. Of course, uh, just like in the case of Caesar, this was the same thing. Once you're given these emergency war powers, you don't want to give them up, and you won't give them up. Uh, that happens, you know, in, like I said, in real life. It happens in mythology, and that's what the trickster does. Just when you think it might be going well, they do something to trip you up. Um, and, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, Rob's talking about these setbacks, uh, you know, falling down, uh, in many cases, um, the trickster is the one that provides those uh, opportunities for them to fall so they can get back up. You know, if it weren't for Jar Jar, I mean, you you have a point. I mean, a lot of people just kind of dismiss him as kind of the goof, the clown, the, uh, the, the bumbling fool in the prequel trilogy. But his role uh, was pretty significant when it came to the formation of the Galactic Empire and uh, Palpatine's, you know, trajectory to his journey. Uh, to becoming emperor, it's a uh, really cool, really cool thing. And if you, I mean, if you watch the the Clone Wars cartoon, which I'm sure we all have, uh, you'll find that he uses his trickster personality for the good of the Republic as well. He's sent on a few missions. Uh, I think it's most of the missions they didn't want to take themselves, uh, but uh, you know, he's he's sent on these missions and he takes it uh, and he does his best with it and he uses his trickster personality, um, whether that's on purpose or inadvertently. Um, you know, he's also, he inadvertently helps out as well in uh, the Phantom Menace, but he uses that trickster personality to actually help the Republic in the phone Yeah. Yes. So, uh, we've uh, tackled a couple of actual, uh, what do you call it? Um, archetypes. Not, not the archetypes. You've got, uh, you know, the hero, the mentor, the ally, the uh, trickster. The shapeshifter. Uh, next on the docket, you know, we talk about characters like Count Dooku and uh, Grand Moff Tarkin. Um, you had mentioned here in our notes uh, these would be guardian characters. Brad, a little explanation here. Yeah, the the guardian is uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, metaphorical walls to the hero uh, achieving their final goals. So, um, it, obviously, you can they're easy to identify in Lord of the Rings um, and uh, other ones, uh, other stories as well. Uh, but they're the ones that say, hey, your, your path stops here. Mm. Um, uh, so like, uh, like a gatekeeper? Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely a gatekeeper. Um, one even mentions the, the, uh, the knight in the... Uh, um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail that's at the bridge there um, that's that's the guardian uh, and he didn't give up his role even though he was completely dismembered uh, he still was trying to fulfill his role as the guardian that's a comedic uh, example of the guardian um, but uh, yeah whether it be uh, Dooku uh, or uh, Tarkin um, I'd have to think about it for the sequel trilogy who's who's providing that uh, actually Unkar plot uh, would be a good guardian mm, yeah. in the sequel trilogy because he's just saying you're you're nothing you're just uh, a little scavenger girl um, so he he fills that role as the guardian that uh, you know you'll never amount to anything so just stay a scavenger and uh, you'll be safe right they're the ones that want to keep them 
in the safe slash ordinary world. Um, so yeah, that's the uh, that's the guardian archetype. You know, it's funny. Uh, you guys are mentioning something in the chat here, uh, David. You had responded to Charlie. Good guys, bad guys, just made up words. You know, and in the notes, uh, we do have Count Dooku, uh, Grand Moff Tarkin. Um, you know, these are characters that, you know, for us watching this movie and hearing the story, those are the bad guys. But mm -hmm. from a character, from a character perspective, that you know, I guess a bad guy doesn't ever think he's a bad guy. He's just a right. guy doing his job and he's doing his, he's got his, you know, his or her own motivations. Um, there's a lot of complexity there. Uh, David, do you want to uh, kind of uh, weigh in on the complexity of these guardians? Sure. And it reminds me of a, an interview that Adam Driver gave where they asked him, uh, you know, oh, well, Kylo Ren be redeemed. And then he's like, what does he need to be redeemed for? Mm. He, he, feels, he feels he's right. He feels he's doing um, what, you know, he thinks is, is the right way. And, you know, characters like uh, Tarkin and, and Dooku, they, you know, Dooku with the Separatists, Tarkin, who at that point with the Republic, but then with the Empire, they are fulfilling their own goals and they could have a messed up way of seeing how that's for the benefit of everybody else but um at the end of the day it's it's not you know he blows up an entire planet um duco instrumental with uh with palpatine and in the war against the uh, the republic and yeah it, when i was reading the notes the guardian was was a an archetype that i really wasn't familiar with so um brad i wanted to actually ask you with these characters, can can any of these archetypes actually change into another one during the course of a film? Uh, yeah, at, during the course of the film, uh, they can. Um, they will certainly change uh, over a complete arc, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, another mm -hmm. Guardian character that I, I didn't mention in the notes uh, was Uncle Owen. Uh, he, Uncle Owen mm -hmm. is basically the Unkar plot of uh, the original trilogy. Um, of course, he, he's, like you guys are saying, he's doing it from his perspective. He's had encounters uh, with Jedi, with mm -hmm. Obi-Wan and with Anakin, and he saw that, you know, what that led to. Uh, and you see with the secret side conversations he's, you know, he has with uh, Aunt Beru, uh, he doesn't want that. So he, he's not doing it, like, so you see from Luke's perspective, he just thinks, oh, you know, Uncle Owen's a jerk. He doesn't want me to go to the academy. Uh, Uncle Owen's trying to protect him, right? right? So that's how he sees it. He's trying to – yes, he needs the help. I, of course, there's probably some selfish uh, reasons there. He does need help with the farm. But he's also trying to protect Luke because he knows what that path could lead to. So these Guardians aren't always the bad guys. You know, I, I mentioned some bad guys in the notes, but they are good as well. Uh, Unker yeah. Plot also would have mixed motivations for Ray. Uh, obviously, he's, you know, she's helping him to make money off these. But, uh, and, you know, you, a lot of this is up for interpretation, but she was left with him. Um, I'm not sure. I, we don't really want to get into that. But, um, yeah, the, the characters do change. Um, you know, Luke's, I mean, Luke being the biggest evolution uh, from the hero, then he comes back as the mentor character. The same thing happened with. Uh, with Obi-Wan. He's the mm -hmm. hero uh, and then obviously he comes back as the mentor uh, for Luke. Um, they will fulfill, the, it's not none of these roles are meant to be cut and dry. They may seem that way um, but they, you know, they are fairly fluid and you can go from one um, you know, we talked about Lando a couple times. He is the shapeshifter. He does sort of fulfill the trickster role as well and he has his own hero's journey uh, as well. So yeah, they will go from archetype to arc. They will fill one main archetype, and they will normally fill you know a couple more uh, sub uh, archetypes throughout a film and throughout a storyline. I would also say like you know they call them threshold guardians as well, right? So it's yes. it's the thing that's keeping you from getting to the next level. Uh, so you could even look at the Daniel Craig stormtrooper in. Uh, in Force Awakens, when Ray's, you know, uh, secured to the interrogation table, and she has to figure out a way to convince him to release her so that she can escape, um, you know, that was that was the situation where she had to learn how to use the Force kind of at another level. 
in order to uh, mind trick him into you know, releasing her bonds. And uh, it doesn't always have to be like a major character within the film. They could there could be many of them throughout just the single film. Yep, and uh, Watto Watto was a guardian yeah. in the prequel trilogy. Right? Yep. Yep. He owned a, I mean, this guy just owns a junk shop, uh, but he would be uh, happy to just to keep Anakin and Shmi as slaves. Um, and keeping him from fulfilling his destiny. So yeah, they uh, all shapes and sizes, as Charlie said in the chat. Yeah, you know it's it's very interesting because uh, you know we just thought this was just a simple movie uh, about spaceships, wizards, and laser swords, but uh, it turns out to be a lot deeper than uh, anyone ever uh, imagined. Uh, and you know, 40, 40 plus years later, we're still kind of analyzing and kind of breaking it down. Um, you know, what, one of the things, though, you know, I I like to believe that you know, older fans like ourselves, you know, we we kind of all know this stuff, but we're kind of, you know, uh, shepherding in the new fans and and some of the younger fans that uh, may not know the details of this aspect of our story here, and um, I think it's going to be. Uh, you know, a, a really cool thing. Um, you know, the next part of uh, our talk here on archetypes is probably going to be uh, one of my favorites because of uh, my, I don't know, penchant and love for the dark side and uh, Darth Vader. Um, but speaking of dark side, uh, we have uh, a new, not new, he's uh, our uh, other part of the Scarif Scuttlebutt podcast, Mr. Alex, Imperial Entanglements himself. How's it going? Welcome, uh, Alex, to the chat, everybody. Hey, everybody. How's everybody going today? Good. What's going on, good, Everybody good? He's got to show off with his silky voice. <laughs> no. That's just silly talk. I'm just here to talk about Star Wars. How long until your son makes his appearance? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give it like 20 minutes. From the camera's on, man. 20 minutes. <laughs> That is correct. Charlie Skywalker, Scarif Skies, and hashtag Team Scarif is on deck. But uh, getting back to our discussion here, you know, uh, Darth Vader is my favorite character of all Star Wars and probably of, of any movie anywhere. Um, besides the fact that he's uh, such a badass, just something about him um, just resonates with me. And, uh, you know... Again, in your notes, Brad, you got Shadow, you've got uh, the uh, the Phantom Menace, you've got Vader, characters like Palpatine. Um, you know, these type of characters really go way back, and I'm talking like way back, biblical proportions, fallen angel back. So it's uh, it's it, Vader is is the man. I mean, um, let's talk a little bit about these Shadow characters and what they represent. Um, and especially, I, I, I have a feeling that we're going to go really deep because we've got that scene in The Empire Strikes Back when Luke fights the image of Vader and what happens there. What is that all about? Brad, let's, uh, let's kind of kick it off here. The uh, shadow character, what's going on with that? The shadow character definitely has the possibility, and I think I'm with you, obviously. I think uh, usually is the most interesting character uh, in the story. They... Um, you know, they have their own motivations, but there's a reason why George started, you know, uh, entitled Episode One, The Phantom Menace. George Lucas is huge on these archetypes, right? It's a shadow. It's, it's a phantom. It's the thing that is the ultimate challenge for the hero. There is a reason why the Sith are always clad in black. There is a reason why the Emperor goes around in a black robe. There is a reason why Darth Vader is clad in black, because um, you recognize him. But he is a physical walking shadow. There is there is no physical man there. There is a shadow. You see the same thing when Palpatine is walking, and his face, you cannot see his face. His face is in a shadow, right? These are the things, right? And you talked about biblical. Obviously, these are characters that are also in the Bible, in, in religion, as well as other mythological tales it's the shadow it's the it's the dark side uh, as a juxtaposition to the light side they are the ones that provide the ultimate challenge for the hero and the thing or the creature or the character that the hero has to defeat and overcome for them to actually meet their full potential and uh, realize their destiny 
You know, something about the dark characters, you know, I, I, I sometimes also feel that these characters are also a manifestation of uh, the dark side within each of us. And, um, you know, uh, Alex, since you are uh, you just hopped on, uh, what do you think about that? You know, uh, good guys, bad guys, do we have a little dark side in, in each of us? What's going on with that? I'll say that we have the potential, not necessarily that it's always there, but we have the potential to turn uh, dark, which is the the warning that these characters give uh, give off uh, for the main characters that are in the movie, the ones that we're supposed to resonate with and connect with uh, the the darker versions or the the dark side that they have to fight against is, of course, something that they inevitably not inevitably. I'm sorry, uh, potentially could become, uh, which you very well pointed out in episode five uh, when Luke fights the uh, this vision of Darth Vader and then when the mask gets revealed it's actually him underneath it it's it's what could have become if he were to make the wrong steps moving forward and that's something that we see a lot um, we see especially in Star Wars but like the hero's journey uh, in in mythological stories we see that a lot we see uh, we even saw it with Rey. Rey had the similar vision in uh, The Rise of Skywalker when she was on the Death Star. You know, she saw a version of herself that she could have become. And, uh, you know, she had a quick little uh, fight with them. And I think Anakin, Anakin's dark side shadow was Palpatine. And we get to see how the wrong steps that he takes eventually leads him into that, into that path where he's become one with the Emperor. Or he's become on that side. So... We have the we have the two the dueling uh, storylines. We see Anakin's fall, and then we see Luke's uh, rise and and surpassing what his father had failed to do and becoming the hero instead of falling to the dark side. So, um, I mean, it's it's such a great motif. It's such a great way of storytelling that gets you to connect uh, with these characters and kind of make them relatable to you because everybody knows that battle that they have like oh what if i the decisions that you make in your everyday life could lead you down one path or if you stick to the morally right or the morally righteous uh the or the um uh what's what george phrase it as is being uh unselfish you know giving to others as opposed to being selfish and taking that's your everyday struggle and that's why we connect with these characters so strongly yeah david uh what do you think of uh, these shadow characters? Well, one thing that I really saw is uh, something that always tempted the, the hero, whether it be the dark side or not, was always temptation. Um, in the prequels, it was, you know, when Anakin's about to leave, it's that temptation of, of home and wanting to, you know, save his mother and saying, you know, I'll, I'll stay. And Shmi saying, no, go. You know, this is, this is what needs to happen. You have to go. And don't look back. And I always look at that moment when the first time he runs back and then, you know, head down going forward and, and he doesn't give in to that temptation in that moment. Um, but in Empire, after the cave, it's, um, you know, when he feels his friends are in danger. Again, that's the temptation. And it ultimately leads him to Cloud City and then we see what happens there. Um, prematurely goes and faces Vader, um, loses his hand in the process, and then finally, uh, when Yoda says, you know, unfortunate, you know, that, that you found this out then instead of um, now when you were more ready to deal with this, um, with this, uh, with this thing. But yeah, the, the dark side is always the most interesting thing. And then especially with Kylo and the sequel trilogy, knowing now, and so we touched on earlier, Ro, a lot of the interesting stuff is left in the comics. Um, which would have really helped out the sequel trilogy, knowing a lot of what had happened to him. Um, but it's that that figure that really just eats away at you um, and tells you that you really can't be anything unless you know you kill your past and you become this other thing entirely. Yeah, that's uh, you know the whole killing your past um, is a. Uh, uh, an interesting concept, um, especially in the uh, sequel trilogy. But you know, it, it also comes down to just uh, decisions that uh, these characters make. I want to um, touch uh, a little bit about what Alex said. You know, regarding the presence of, and I, I, I don't want to say evil. I hear somebody's feedback. 
It stopped because I stopped talking. <laughs> um, Maybe it's I, you. I wanted to, I wanted to just kind of mention you know uh, there is a duality with the person um, I guess with personality um, I, I think that's one of the things that intrigues me about uh, Vader obviously when I first saw Vader nobody knew what his backstory nobody knew who he was you know visually stunning he just came through that door and people just connected just for the visuals but as we get to know a little more about vader um and what uh his decisions were and things like that you kind of really uh start you know his character really starts to transform into a tragic character where we know that some of the choices that he made uh were probably not the right ones you know he did um you know kind of fall from grace you know getting back to the biblical aspects of it but uh you know he did it for a reason he did it for something that that he believed in and for someone that he loved and tried to you know to get back really um so that is you know it, it's kind of it's kind of uh, interesting to me um getting back to the duality of, of dark and light within a character um i do want to kind of push back a little bit and say that we Yes, we have the potential of, but without the fact that we have that inside ourselves, then the potential couldn't possibly be there. So we have it in there. It's just, you know, again, just like Anakin chose to um, do what he did, it's up to us to kind of be our own archetypes when it comes to guardians um, to try to kind of stave off that, that evil, stave off that, uh, that temptation. Um, but, um, Rob, what do you, what do you think about, uh, duality and, and do we have that evil in us? Well, for, uh, it kind of ties back to the earlier conversation about the dark side cave on Dagobah. And I want to touch on that for just a moment because I read that scene two ways. First, there's certainly, uh, the dark side, um, showing Luke that, that he has the potential to become like Vader, but I also feel like it's also telling him a truth. Uh, in the sense that it is his blood. It's his flesh and blood behind that mask. It's his father. So it's kind of foretelling a little bit of what is to come later in that episode. Um, and it's also kind of a warning to him about what could become of him if he's not careful. So there's there's a duality even within that scene itself. Um, but one of the things that I, that I actually agreed with in The Last Jedi, and again, not my favorite film, but there were kernels of it that I that I thought were good. The prime Jedi that you see in the chamber where Luke and Ray are having that conversation, and it's very much got that yin yang yin, yin and yang symbology uh, going on there with you know the light half with just the kernel of dark and vice versa. Um, so uh, you know I think I do think we all have that duality within us. I do think we have the potential for both good and evil. Um, I think in a lot of ways, if you look at it kind of within current culture, you see, uh, you know, athletes and movie stars, they have money, they have uh, all these people that want to be in proximity to them just because of their fame and fortune, and they have a lot more opportunity to make those bad decisions that end up kind of tainting their character. Uh, and so, you know, maybe not something that the rest of us have to deal with on a day in and day out basis, but... I do think that there are scenarios where where that presents itself more, and that's the characters that we see within Star Wars, especially the Jedi and the Sith. They have these powers, they have these abilities to do things that, that most people cannot do, and it's really the temptation of that power to use it either for the good of those around them or for their own selfish reasons. And, um, you know, when it comes to, to Anakin, specifically in his fall, what we talked about the other night, uh, he wanted to save Padme, but he wanted it for his own selfish reasons. He didn't want to lose Padme. It wasn't for Padme's, uh, you know, good. It was because she, you know, he had this possessiveness towards her, uh, and that is kind of where you start seeing him slide the wrong way. You know, he slaughters the Tusken Raiders because they killed Shmi, and he was upset about that, uh, as opposed to you know being accepting the fact that that bad things sometimes happen to good people and and it was uh 
It was just one of those things that happens in the universe, I guess. Wipe them out. Yes. All of them. Hey, bro, can I can I hop on? Uh... Yeah, yeah. All right. So I want to uh, respond to a couple things specifically that uh, Rob was mentioning, I think, in the chat and uh, provide some clarification. Um, and that is that the shadow, quote unquote, character is not necessarily evil. I think it was Rob that said that in the chat. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I agree with that. And I want to provide some clarification on that. What, it's important to remember both George Lucas and Joseph Campbell based a lot of their work on Carl Jung. A lot of these archetypes do uh, do come from Carl Jung. And the shadow represents that. It, you can say the dark side in quotes, but it also represents that which you are repressing. Right? So it's the thing that you do not want to face. Mm -hmm. Right? And if you look at it from a real life perspective, when people repress things, that's why they have health issues, right? Um, you know, Anakin doesn't want to face these things. He represses these things, and they come back to haunt him later on. Um, you know, Luke is sort of in denial on Dagobah, uh, you know, when he, when he meets Yoda. He says, I'm not afraid, and uh, Yoda comes back cryptically with, good, you will be, right? What, what's he trying to say there? He, he wants him to basically face his demons. Right. Uh, if if he doesn't face them, they will come back to haunt you. These are phantoms, right? They will come back to haunt you later on. So yeah. the shadow is that thing which you do not want to face. And so what these archetypes do is they use physical characters. They use the outward world to explain what's going on the on the inside. So all of these things, whether it's the hero, uh, whether it's the guardian the shapeshifter or even the shadow these are things that are happening in everybody's mind all the time and that's what these stories do they provide you characters to help explain these things but every day all day these things are going on inside everybody's own psyche and that's what carl Jung and joseph campbell and george lucas were, were trying to portray um, and, and that's more what the shadow character is and that's this goes back to our uh conversation uh roe and alex i know you know, all three of us love that conversation about the dark side. Is it necessarily evil? And, you know, that's when I argued then the dark side inherently is not evil. I still believe that. It's just what you do, how you respond and how you use the dark side is what makes you evil. But I don't think inherently itself is evil. It's the, it's the thing that you are avoiding or repressing. And that's where the shadow character comes from. Mm -hmm. And that's where the imbalance comes from. If I remember correctly, can I t touch on something real quick, Ro? Yeah, David, do it. Um, so I mentioned in, in the chat here, uh, you know, Yoda facing his dark side self in the Clone Wars and him beating it by really not fighting it, but acknowledging that it existed. Um, and, you know, in The Last Jedi, I, in that throne room sequence, after Kylo kills Snoke, you have Ray with, you know, blue light, the blue lightsaber shining on his face. You then you go over to Kylo, he's got the red lightsaber red on his face. But then they're back to back. And they're, the dark side and the light are working together in this moment. And there's a, a, a moment in the fight where they're back to back. And then they are, it, it's a movement where they're, they're kind of forming a yin and yang. Uh, if, if you see a still shot of that fight. And I thought that that's, where they were going to go with the story instead of bringing it back to the regular light side versus dark side um, uh, you know, storyline that we got in The Rise of Skywalker, bringing it back to um, some of the things with uh, Return of the Jedi. But I thought they were finally going to really acknowledge that, look, everybody has this within them. If you fight it, you will embrace it at some point. Um, it's what happened to... Uh, Anakin with, you know, the visions he was having of Padme, his fear of losing her, that ultimately, you know, uh, I'll do whatever you ask, just teach me how to save Padme's life, I can't live without her. Um, in The Last Jedi, it's, you know, Kylo telling Rey, you're nothing, you have no place in this story, but if you come with me, I'll show you, you know, what, uh, you mean something to me, and then, you know, obviously she refuses his hand there, but I really thought that they were going to acknowledge that it's the fact that the light side and the dark side can work together, but not overtake each other, um, but to work in this perfect balance. And that's when I thought the force was the most powerful was in that scene 
when the dark and the light were not at odds, but they were fighting uh, together and embracing uh, sort of the best parts of each side. I just wanted David, to touch on that real quick. Yeah, David, I 100% thought, or at least hoped and prayed, that the word Bendu was going to be used in Episode Nine. I yeah. hope that they created this. I think he is one of the most amazing characters in the Star Wars universe. Uh, you know, and we talked about it in that previous show where he blamed not just the Sith for all the stuff that's happening in the galaxy. He blamed the Jedi, too, mm -hmm. and said, you guys need to hold yourselves to account and basically told Kanan to get lost if, if he doesn't want to listen to what he has to say. Right. And, you know, and I thought, you know, nobody wants to talk about the Great Jedi, but we will stay away from the term Great Jedi. But that Bendu that you're talking about, which the Bendu is represented in that uh, uh, on the island, as Rob was saying, uh, in that... Uh, uh, where, whatever building that was there uh, in yeah. the temple, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I thought they were going to say the word Bendu, and that's you know embracing both the light and the dark. You know, and uh, talk about Ahsoka. Mm -hmm. Ahsoka stopped being a Jedi. Ahsoka, we've seen her. She's her most effective, not as a Jedi. Mm -hmm. She's been effective. We've seen it uh, in the uh, new Clone Wars uh, season, uh, this last one that we have, and uh, her work uh, in the Star Wars Rebel show. Just because she didn't have the, the title Jedi, she's still doing amazing work. She was fine with not being a Jedi, uh, but she embraced who she was, and I think it helped her to excel as a character. That's mm -hmm. that's why I don't think that Jedi and Sith, um, you know, their their classifications of people who adhere to dark side or light side principles, but it really comes down to selflessness versus selfishness, and. You know that that is really more the divide. Um, you don't have to be. You know, you've got Maz Kanata who has apparently his force abilities, um, but she she clearly is off kind of creating her own smuggler's empire. Uh, but she's looking out for others as well. We see her show back up uh, on the side of the light in Rise of Skywalker. You know, it's uh, funny in another universe the uh, aspect of you know running a business that disney is doing and uh selling star wars to a mass audience uh doesn't take precedent over telling a story built with so much lore because something like the bendu um i think especially in this last film the rise of skywalker was was really would have been really really essential to understand especially the the scene david that you were talking about um, bringing in elements of the mythology of the father, the sister, the uh, the the, uh, the brother during the uh, Clone Wars, or no, the Rebels uh, Mortis arc. Um, all of those things really come into play um, now. I think late later in in, in the process of of uh, you know rolling out this mythology of the force and and all the stuff that George and Dave Filoni you know were kind of co-creating and kind of kind of uh, you know building up to something just phenomenal something different in Star Wars that people have not had a chance to really uh, you know sink their teeth in and I think you know unfortunately you know the business of selling Star Wars I think got in the way of being able to tell um, that type of story, because for us that follow that stuff, it's a, uh, uh, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. I mean, look at everybody's comment about the Bendu. I mean, it's you know the uh, what an incredible creation and what an incredible character too to be able to kind of, you know, guts. You know, it's a gutsy thing to be able to tell a Jedi and a Sith, chill. You guys are the problems. You you, you know the Force belongs to no one. There is no dark side of the Force. It's just mm -hmm. it's there. Um, so it's, you know, it, it, it's unfortunate, but, um, you know, getting back to our, um, our, hey, hey, our, can our, I, can I yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I, I thank the science fictionary for the comment about uh, the Bendu. Uh, I'm going to challenge that, um, taking a look at, uh, taking a look at history, human history, how many wars have been fought because of some people thought they were good or they were morally right and they thought some other group was bad, inherently bad. Just about every single major war was based off of that. 
Um, obviously, wars are fought for many reasons. Uh, money, power, land, what have you. But, you know, take a look at the Crusades, and that was large groups fighting over who was right, who was wrong. Um, and the same thing, uh, as uh, Rob was saying, um, you know, the Jedi and the Sith. How many millennia did the Sith and the Jedi fight each other because one thought one was right, one thought one was wrong? And if you take it from a galactic perspective, how many trillions of people, you have to be talking in the numbers in the trillions, how many trillions of people had to have died because they were caught up in this war between the Jedi and the Sith? So if you take a look at the Bendu, I, I can see your perspective, how you thought, <clears throat> excuse me, how you thought he might be, uh, you know, how, you know, that's obviously from Kanan's point of view. But if you look at it, he also ended that conflict that was happening uh, on that planet, you know, with his lightning storm. And, uh, he resolved it. Um, and, uh, you know, because the Jedi uh, and the dark side were fighting there as well. And he ended it. And. Uh, he is that balance in the middle. So, yeah, I, you know, and originally I did kind of see him as a, as a cop out. You know, he didn't, uh, uh, you know, want to take sides. It's not about taking sides. It's about finding that balance between, as as David's saying, find that balance within yourself. Uh, you know, and if you don't have that balance, you become out of whack. The, the Jedi, you no know, one, a lot of people don't want to say the Jedi were out of balance as well. They became so uh, blinded by their moral superiority. Now, this is all coming from me. This is my perspective. They became so blinded that they didn't see what was happening right in front of their faces. Count Dooku told Obi-Wan the truth. He literally told him the truth that there was a Sith Lord yeah. leading the Senate. And Obi-Wan... <laughs> One of the wisest Jedi out there refused to believe it. No, nah, I can't be. The Jedi would have. Jedi would know that you're lying. He literally told him the truth, but they were so out of balance with their moral superiority, and this is what Luke later was talking to Ray about in that same temple, right? They were blinded. They had hubris. So it's not about picking sides. It's about finding balance within yourself mm -hmm. uh, and being able to embrace all aspects of yourself. My turn. Said there's that damn word again, hubris. <laughs> I'm not going down that path. I know you got an episode coming out on that, so. <laughs> I thought. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think Andrew had uh, a comment regarding the fact that, uh, you know, Star Wars has always been just, you know, pretty straightforward, you know, good guys, bad guys, good and evil. Um, but uh, I, I do think that there are, would be room for uh, not interpretation, but maybe uh, challenging those thoughts and bringing Star Wars uh, a little bit more to the modern world. And I know, I think The Last Jedi tried to do that. Uh, it didn't work for me, but um, interesting thoughts, you know, for the most part. Um, how do you guys, how do you guys, uh, I guess... How would you guys have handled uh, bringing a concept such as this to a general public? Like I said, it's, you know, Star Wars for the general public, people are, that are not like, you know, super fans like us don't mind that. But do you think that this would have confused a lot of people going forward? Alex, what do you think? You guys are confusing me right now. I thought so. <laughs> no, uh, I, I'm kind of a purist, I suppose. I like Star Wars being the, I mean, if you want to call it simplistic, you can call it simplistic, but I like the good versus evil motif. It, um, I think it's ageless. It, it, it tr translates to all different cultures and time. And what we're running into now with kind of muddying the water with like these gray versions, and you don't have to be bad to be bad. You can be good and bad. It kind of just muddies the water for me. I don't really enjoy it. The Bendu, I feel like it's just a fence sitter. He doesn't want to take responsibility for anything. <laughs> just pointing the finger at everybody else. Um, I, I like my Star Wars being very basic and simple. And I think if they wanted to introduce these types of uh, moral conundrums into the universe, I would probably not have done it with uh, a heavy connection to the original trilogy. I feel like Luke, Leia, Han, their children, Rey, you could have kept it 
with that very basic black and white model. And then if you wanted to introduce these weird things, uh, I mean, Rebels is a good place to do it if, uh, of, out of anybody. Um, I think Kane in dealing with the Bendu and, and uh, Ezra. I mean, that's a good... I don't mind them messing around with that idea in there. Uh, as far as like a movie goes for like general audiences, um, I would have liked to have seen something like this tackled maybe as like a, a way in the past prequel where the Jedi and the Sith uh, find themselves at odds. They, you know, the, the first time that that happens, um, there's a, a difference of, I don't know, what do you, lifestyle. I don't know what the word is. Um, it just where they split you know because I, I believe if, if it's in canon uh, at least old legends canon that the jedi and the sith were once kind of aligned but then they they fundamentally disagreed on how to use the force and then they split off and um i think doing some kind of a prequel that would deal with this kind of uh message would probably be better than having it dealt with uh in like current era star wars yeah, I can see that. Um, you know, the, the only thing that I would, uh, you know, double back on is, you know, at some point, you know, this is a 40 plus year old franchise. At some point you have to introduce something, uh, you know, new and interesting. Um, otherwise it kind of gets old. Um, I wouldn't mind, you know, I wouldn't mind, uh, like you said, Alex, if, you know, if they if they did something like this in some of the stuff that they may be, you know, reaching for f with uh, the books in August, I think that would be kind of an interesting thing. But, uh, you know, getting back to our talk about the mythology and the archetypes, um, David, let's talk a little bit about Rebirth. Uh, we talked about the cave. We talked about even, you know, sequences of uh, the X-Wings going into the Death Star, you know, the belly of the beast. Um, let's talk a little bit about Rebirth in Star Wars, the redemption and, and all that stuff. What do you think about that? Well, for me, it's the one, it's the part of Star Wars that I always kind of look forward to when I try to answer upon the first viewing, like whether or not a character um, has the, the ability to be redeemed. And obviously in the sequel trilogy, right from the get-go, after Force Awakens, is, no, there's no way Kyle is going to be redeemed. He killed Han Solo, he killed his father. But in mythology, and Brad, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, if you... The, the really irredeemable act is if you kill your mother. Um, it, it, if you kill your father, it's kind of like that, something that it happens a lot in fairy tales. Um, and they kind of teased this in The Last Jedi with the trailer. You see Kylo with his fingers on the trigger and cutting to Leia on the bridge, and he ultimately doesn't do it. And Leia is ultimately the one that kind of uh, sets him on the path of redemption in Episode Nine. Um, but yeah, it's always interesting, like, wh who qualifies for that redemption? Um, Vader, you know, obviously, there's always the jokes of the, the Padawans in Episode 3, um, that he slaughtered, a, a, you know, so many people, and then he found his redemption at the end of, of uh, Return of the Jedi. And with Kylo, seeing now with the rise of Kylo Ren, how he was manipulated almost his entire life and believed that what Snoke was saying... Uh, and now we know it was Palpatine the entire time, just manipulating his mind into believing that he was this monster that he felt everybody else thought he was. Ultimately, in uh, in Episode Nine, it was just um, he never had that feeling of um, controlling his own destiny. You know, he never wanted to be a Jedi in the beginning. He just wanted to be a pilot like Han. But they thrust him with Luke and set him on that path to become a Jedi. And uh, when we see him at, at the end of episode nine, it's once he, he lets go of all of that, the scars go away. Um, he is acting like uh, the son of Han Solo. And, you know, I'm one of the people that I really wish we would have gotten something different in nine with a not so much. A, well, he would have gotten the redemption, but also atonement for. Um, for everything that, that had happened before. Uh, and I think it would have been something different. We have never seen what happens to a, a redeemed character. Um, it's always, you know, they're redeemed and then they die, uh, as we saw with Vader. So I think they were just following that um, kind of plotline with Episode Nine and Return of the Jedi. So I'm really interested to see what you guys think about it. 
Yeah, Brad, in your notes you have uh, the, the mentor usually dies, but it uh, looks like the, the redeemed also dies. I did want to point out something that, you know, people are always saying, well, Darth Vader was redeemed. Why can't Kylo be redeemed? You know, um, Darth Vader, I think, was not redeemed by the galaxy and absolved of his, you know, quote, unquote, sins. Uh, it's a situation where, you know, his son is the one that gives him the power to be redeemed through his eyes. Um, and we're getting into like, a, 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 you know, some really deep, you know, um, Christian Judeo type of uh, teachings here. But, you know, as we learned in the Claudia Gray novel, Bloodline, I think it was, you know, people were still pissed off at Darth Vader. I mean, he was a bad guy. Um, the fact that he was redeemed, it wasn't that, you know, the, you know, he did all these, uh, awful things and the galaxy's like, okay, well, he's redeemed. I, I forgive him. It, that's not, definitely not the case. Um, you know, he was redeemed by his son and, uh, you know, it was that relationship that kind of, uh, you know, are, uh, we're talking about here, but, uh, you know, rebirth and redemption, um, it's, it's a, a tricky subject. Um, Rob, what do you think about rebirth and redemption in Star Wars? I don't believe in any of it. <laughs> Agnostic. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, the thing is, is that there's far more interesting examples of redemption, uh, certainly within the expanded universe. I mean, you talk about the fact that Vader was never really forgiven by the universe and he... Uh, he may have been redeemed by Luke and Luke's actions, but he then immediately died. It's not like he had to carry on. But there were stories of uh, students of, of Luke Skywalker when he started the Jedi Academy within the expanded universe, where uh, they were in, you know influenced by dark side uh, force spirits, and they went off and they killed millions of people, uh, and then were brought back to the light side, and then carried on as Jedi from that point. So that's that's kind of interesting in the sense that we never really see that in the films. No one ever comes back from going to the dark side and then continues on as a member of the Jedi Order from that point. Um, it generally has to do with them dying. But, you know, it's interesting because you sit there and we talk about the fact that Kylo was influenced by Palpatine uh, through Snoke in the sequel trilogy, but Anakin was very much messed with uh and and screwed with in the head by palpatine all through the original trilogy sorry the prequel trilogy uh we see a ton of it in the clone wars and it's not just the mind games that palpatine's playing with him it is actually him physically stripping away those those uh people in anakin's life that he can rely on to kind of keep him on a on a light side path uh and so you know, you sit there and look at the fact that, yeah, Anakin made the decision to go in and slaughter the young ones. No one was holding the knife to his throat while he was doing it, but he had been taken to the point where he'd had his head screwed with so much, and he really thought that at that point the only person that he could count on in order to save Padme, which was his ultimate goal, was Palpatine, uh, and that was all a lie anyway. So, um, you know, I know we talk about him being reborn as Darth Vader in the prequel trilogy at the end there. Uh, again, kind of being reborn as Anakin Skywalker uh, as he's laying there dying on the, on the, uh, in the hangar bay of the Death Star. Um, but yeah, sometimes the rebirth is, is kind of not exactly a literal rebirth like you're thinking. Um, you know, Luke and his rebirth after the death of Obi Wan, him kind of coming to the realization that he was no longer, he no longer had someone to directly mentor him. He was going to kind of have to find his own way and uh, start taking action and, and taking control of his own destiny. And uh, what, I, what people need to realize is that redemption is uh, it's very Star Wars specific. Uh, the word redemption not too big of a theme in the hero's journey path as described by Joseph Campbell. Hmm. So when we talk about redemption, that's more specifically for uh, Star Wars. When we talk about rebirth and resurrection, that is an internal, and, and Rob was uh, alluding to this as well, the rebirth and resurrection, and I've, you know, you'll have a lot of biblical references to this as well, that's an internal process, right? What that means is you have, your old self has died, and you have been reborn as a new person. So mm -hmm. after 
Luke pulls the trigger, sends the proton torpedo down the Death Star, blows up the Death Star, he can't possibly go back to Tatooine and be a moisture farmer. It would not work. His life would not work, right? So he has been reborn as a new person. Um, same thing with Rey. Um, after what she went through, she couldn't just go back to Jakku and uh, be a scavenger. It, it would not work. That is not who she is anymore. So the rebirth and resurrection is an internal process. And take a look at your, you know, your own life. Um, you're not the same person that you were, you know, even six months ago. But, you know, if you go back and analyze some of your uh, world perspectives of, say, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you probably would not even recognize that person. Right. I was an idiot. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Because life (laughs) has changed you. Right. You have faced these challenges. You have, you know, uh, one of the greatest, uh, not the greatest, but, you know, one of the interesting memes I saw, you know, when life gets tough, that just means you just leveled up. And that kind of that's a simple way of explaining this. Um, you just, you, you know, you're at a new level of your, your ascension. That's what it's all about. So, I mean, if you go back and look at your old self, you probably won't even recognize that person. And that's what the rebirth and resurrection is about, you know, um, and, and happened to Luke uh, many times from when we met him on Tatooine all the way up until, you know, he was evolving uh, through the rise of Skywalker, uh, he, you know, consistently or constantly uh, dying and being reborn as a new person. So uh, you got to separate redemption and, and resurrection or rebirth. Those are separate concepts. Redemption's very Star Wars specific. Uh, rebirth and resurrection are more in line with the hero's journey, uh, generically speaking. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, religious uh, subtext here because, um, you know, everything from the, um, the serpent talking to you in the garden, Palpatine, you know, talking to, to uh, Kylo, uh, the rebirth, redemption, you know, belly of the cave, uh, all that stuff. You know, are these some of the things, uh, Brad, you can talk about this. Are these some of the things that really uh, strike a note with us subconsciously? Is this why we are drawn to these stories so much? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you're, you're going in for a um, going for a job interview. Why do you have anxiety when you're going in for a job interview? Right, you're you're literally going into the belly of the beast. You're encountering someone you've never met before. They're gonna challenge you. They're gonna ask you questions that you know you may or may not be prepared for, and you got to give the right answer. And your future could be dependent on how this one-hour interview goes. Right. So the belly, you know, the the trash compactor, uh, that was sort of the belly of the beast. Uh, you know, one of the you know, one of the examples in uh, mm. in a new hope. Right. The, the, you know, your life in a trash compactor. Uh, you never thought you'd be here, but somehow you're here, and now you got to deal with it. So they resonate with us because they're they're very realistic. Whenever you encounter something, whether it you know uh, you have a uh, you know a child on the way, or you're in a new relationship, or like I said you're going for a job interview, uh, or you just lost your job, right? All of these are challenges that uh, are are real life challenges that are described in the hero's journey, uh, and that's going into the belly of the beast and. You know, if you have some personal issues that you're trying to overcome, right? You're you're facing these shadows, the dark side, right? We can relate to these movies because these are realistic themes uh, that happen to us day in and day out. Um, so yeah, the you know you see the you know, and then go back and look at your life. So hopefully, when people hear this uh, and see this uh, podcast, they they can do this now. You know, go back and look at it and. It, and then you understand, you know, why you made the decisions you made. And then you can go back and look at it. Maybe I would have done something different. How would it have turned out if I did something different, right? Uh, this is no room for regret. There, there's no room for that. But, you know, uh, go back and look at your own life from, from a hero's journey perspective. We all have a hero's journey, right? You're in, like I said, there's a, there's a large overarching hero's journey for all of our lives. But within that, there's just tons of smaller cycles with it so you know, take a look at your own life from that perspective and you'll find a, a lot more makes sense on why things happen the way they do gee thanks brad now i'm all nervous <laughs> <laughs> sorry man. 
You know, Alex, you talk about being a purist and uh, how your life was different uh, several years ago. And I'm glad that uh, you and I have met during your hero's journey at this particular point in, in both of our lives. Um, thank you very much for being such a hero to me. Um, what, uh, again, get, getting back to being a purist, um, you know, we are used to kind of Star Wars, even from the beginning, just being good and bad, you know, good and evil and, and that fight. Um, how has the uh, sequel trilogy changed that up a little bit? You were talking about, let's get really specific. You were talking about how that muddles up the, the mythology of, of what we know. Um, and obviously there are changes in the sequel trilogy that... Um, you know, we've all talked about that uh, we're not too keen on, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, the inclusion of certain characters that logically might come into play to kind of bring uh, about a closure. Um, specifically, I'm talking about, you know, uh, the balance of the force and all that stuff. Um, how does the... Uh, are you seeing the hero's journey different in the sequel trilogy now than what we're used to from the original trilogy or even the uh, prequels? Uh, that's kind of hard to nail down because the, the sequel trilogy very much does its, its own thing in each movie. And you can equate that to being Ryan Johnson and J.J. Abrams having different visions for it. Uh, I know personally I feel like J.J. Abrams made two movies or tried to make three movies into two with his his vision of what he wanted to do with the characters and Ryan Johnson did his own thing so it's kind of hard to follow that template if you if you take the hero's journey and you lay it down and you you put it up against the uh, the sequel trilogy it, eh, I mean in my personal opinion just looking at it and, and kind of doing research on it I don't think it quite fits um, the typical you know storyboards for the for the hero's journey I know Ray uh, in the Force Awakens, she does have those uh, those points in her life where, like, the call to action, the refusal. She meets the new characters. She meets the wise old man. Whether that's um, Han Solo, or you could uh, you could probably argue that it might be uh, Maz Kanata as well. Um, just kind of like that flash into her possible future and and that word of wisdom for her. So there's elements in there, and I know they tried to change it up with Luke. Um, instead of being the Obi-Wan Kenobi character, um, they went a different route with Luke, and I know what Ryan Johnson was trying to do. I didn't personally appreciate it, but I understand what he was trying to do. Is he was trying to do the uh, Kurosawa um, version of the hero, the, the, the jaded kind of, I don't want to be here anymore. This is no longer my life. Let's push that aside. I, I'm, 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 I want to be alone. Like, that was the loop that he wanted to show us. Uh, I, I think a lot of people kind of took that the wrong way, and, and myself included were like, that's not what I want to see. But I do have to admit that I know what he was trying to do. Now, whether or not that came off um, in a, or that was paid off in a great way or not, like, typically with the Kurosawa film, that jaded hero would eventually come back and sacrifice himself for the greater good. Luke did technically do that. It just, again, it was all in delivery and, and how Ryan Johnson chose to, to portray it. Um, whether or not it worked for you or not. So there, there's episode eight kind of threw a wrench in the hero's journey as far as my personal opinion goes with Ray. Um, it it kind of it was like a pause, a break in the hero's journey, and then you kind of see it get picked up again in the Rise of Skywalker where she starts training with uh, Leia. She gets those words of wisdom. Leia takes on that Obi Wan Kenobi um, uh, character. And then she has to face her darker version. Like you see the steps continue on with the hero's journey. So in my opinion, if you're asking about uh, whether or not the sequel trilogy follows the hero's journey, I don't think it does. I think if you take The Force Awakens and The Rise of Skywalker and kind of merge them together, you get a better idea of what it would have been if J.J. had done all three. Uh, but Ryan Johnson really wanted to do his own thing. And that's very evident. And it's kind of up to each individual person whether or not you think it, it worked or not. Yeah, that's an interesting take. Um, go ahead, Brad. Yeah, go ahead, Brad. I was, and I'm, I'm going to ask something of, of David too, because David, um, out of all of us, I think David is is someone that uh, probably enjoys the Last Jedi more than than the rest of us. But I, uh, go ahead, Brad. Yeah. So, you know, let's go back uh, to what we were talking about earlier. Um, I say devil's advocate, but 
how about Ryan's advocate here? Palpatine's uh, advocate. Shadow's it, advocate. It, 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 it's important to remember, like like I said earlier, that this um, this process does repeat itself, right? So the reason a lot of uh, we we say us old folks. Um, you know, we had our own vision of what what we thought Luke should be, right? Um, and that was based off our many, many years of uh, reading the expanded universe. So we had a vision of uh, Luke going into The Last Jedi. Uh, but in Ryan's defense, like I was saying, this process does uh, repeat itself. So even though uh, Luke has moved from the hero role to the mentor role, the hero's journey for him has repeated itself. So if you look at that arc for him as a mentor, he still goes for the call to adventure. Ray shows up with his lightsaber. He still goes for the refusal of the call, tossing the lightsaber, uh, which many people took offense to. Uh, and if you look at his arc as the mentor, he follows that same arc uh, of the hero's journey. Uh, and it takes him, you know, from, you know, the, uh, it, you know, he finally does go through with it at the end of uh, The Last Jedi. Um, and uh, he redeems himself, uh, or you say redeems, or he's reborn uh, with a different point of view, even though he's a Force ghost. Uh, he has a new point of view in The Rise of Skywalker that he did uh, in The Last Jedi. So, you know, it, it, it wasn't the Luke that we were expecting, but like I said, in Ryan's defense, he is again following that hero's journey path, as this time as a mentor instead of as the hero. Yeah, I fundamentally I, disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, David. You know, again, I was just mentioning how um, how you know you're probably one that likes uh, or, or enjoys uh, accepts. I don't know what word to use. <laughs> um, uh, the Last Jedi more than than the rest of the team here. Yeah. Uh, but do you see uh, the hero's journey as? Uh, simply put, uh, with the rest of the films, do you see that in the sequel trilogy with, with Ray or any other characters? I do, and obviously, you know, we were talking about how a lot of the interesting stuff that happens with Ray happens, you know, outside of the movies. Um, because if you read uh, the book Before the Awakening, you know that she's been living on Jakku as in this wasteland and having to defend herself for many years, which is why she is a skilled fighter. Um, she builds a, a flight simulator out of, you know, parts she scavenges, which is why she knows how to fly very well. Uh, and she's flown the Falcon before. That's not the first time she's flown the Falcon. Um, and, you know, they, it, it's this thing that we talked about of whether or not Star Wars has required reading. Um, and ultimately it does at this point. The universe is so vast, you can't put, you can't make these movies four hours long. Um, and why not? I'd I watch it four hours. I, so would I. That's how many <laughs> stages they do with Star Wars movie. Um, but with Ring and, and and this trilogy as a whole, you know, the refusal of the calls with the lightsaber, and then um, again the the belly of the beast is Starkiller base when um, she falls into the arms of, of Kylo, he takes her back, and then we realize that that is the point where that dyad that's talked about in Episode Nine. That's when it's realized. When she sees into Kylo's mind, and he's like, uh, "I know you feel, uh, I feel it too." That's when you know they're connected. And in the Last Jedi, they really—that's what that, in my opinion, that's what the cave scene means, um, where she's seeing those two figures approaching her, and then they become one, and then it shows herself. Um, that's the way I interpret it, and I think that's what they finally went with in Episode Nine. Uh, and as far as Luke's character, yeah, he's the mentor at that point. But one thing that I always say about The Last Jedi is that what Han says in The Force Awakens as to why Luke is where he is, J.J. never definitively said, this is what happened to Luke Skywalker. He gave you, um, thing, he, he gave you sort of a, a very vague understanding of what he was doing and what ultimately happened. It was for the next director to take that into the direction um, that he felt he needed to go. Because when Han... Talked. He's like, Luke went uh, searching for the first Jedi Temple. He had students. One turned against him, destroyed everything. That's that's what we see in the flashbacks, um, and I think that's where expectations can really um, hinder your appreciation or, or just how much you enjoyed something. And it's totally fine. Look, when I first saw the last Jedi, I didn't know what the hell. Was. 
Um, it took me a while to on repeat viewings to really grasp the lightsaber toss, um, the nature of what he was doing on the island. Would he just walk away from everything? Um, and I think it's somebody who has seen that problem affect not only his family but the galaxy more than once, and it was a Jedi's own doing. Uh, that's really going to mess you up. And I think that ultimately he becomes the legend that everybody thinks he is, basing off the First Order by himself, by not even fighting, not even being there. It's the ultimate, you know, Jedi act of, you know, nonviolence that he even does in Return of the Jedi. Um, so I feel like that character and then Rey seeing that, uh, I just wish her character would have progressed into something more in episode nine because they i felt like they regressed her character she was still in the white she wasn't sort of uh you know where luke was kind of changed with the bl all black and then with the flap but inside his um his tunic it was white you know it's an it's an outer exterior but still the light shining within her so um yeah last night we'll be talking about probably the end of time, so. <laughs> yeah and you know, almost two hours in, that's we kind of yeah. like veer, veered in that direction. Um, so yeah, you know, one of the interesting things, University of Coruscant, uh, a couple of posts up said the difficulty is that the expanded universe created such a vastly different character over a period of twenty years, and then the change happens in two hours. So it's an incredible whiplash for fans, and I, I kind of agree. Um, but uh, that is neither here nor there. Um, Brad, uh, gentlemen, any uh, other last thoughts on uh, the uh, hero's journey as we have come to understand it here tonight? Well, I think it's been a, a great discussion. Um, uh, you know, I kind of I hope everybody learns something because, you know, uh, even just as we're talking through it uh, and Alex, I, I, you, you, you and I are on the same page as far as The Last Jedi. Um, I... Uh, have my issues with the last Jedi for other reasons, um, but as far as uh, you know, the kind of have a, had a revelation myself there as far as the hero's journey uh, repeating itself uh, with Luke. Um, so you know, I kind of came up with that as we're discussing it, um, and that's why I love having these these deep dive discussions. Is you you come up with thoughts that you know you, you didn't have before. Uh, so I appreciate that we've been talking about this, and um, I, I definitely learned something new in myself. Tonight. Yeah, for sure. You guys always make me make it challenging to hate the Last Jedi as much as I do, because <laughs> when people defend it, who are actually knowledgeable about the, what they're talking about and they have a, a solid argument, it's nice to hear those things. We don't have to, you know, jump down each other's throats for liking a movie or not. But um, I just uh, I can definitely appreciate these kind of deeper conversations. Um, my wife always makes fun of me. She's like, "How much can you talk about Star Wars? It's just Star Wars." Like. It's not that complicated, and I'm like, you don't even know. <laughs> These dudes are on another level. <laughs> We're just scratching the surface. <laughs> so it's always a great time hanging out with you guys and talking about this stuff, and it, it does kind of broaden my perspective on uh, what's acceptable and what's not in Star Wars. And uh, although I do, in my heart, uh, believe I am a purist and I, I want Star Wars to be very simplistic, very black and white, I can appreciate the times that uh the writers and and these creators like dave filoni and and uh, uh even jj and and ryan johnson sometimes can uh <laughs> bring a different a different version of star wars to the screen and uh kind of share what their thoughts are on this so I, I can already say that if you any of you guys were given a star wars movie they would all be vastly different and they would all have a very unique spin on what the force is and what's good and evil and and the the hero's journey motif and all that stuff so uh, yeah, it's always fun talking with you guys. Excellent. So uh, Brad has prepared a special segment for us. We cannot uh, leave the Scare of Scuttlebutt podcast at the end here without playing our uh, wonderful little Q&A uh, game that we've uh, managed to survive all this time, a sentry mode. Uh, I mentioned that uh, in the chat. Chats. If anybody wants to win some stickers, we got um, we got a great opportunity to do that. So uh, I can't play the theme now, but I'll definitely play it if we uh, run this through post. But uh, maybe uh, Alex, because he's set up in his uh, nice little studio, you can go ahead and sing our little sentry mode jingle. 
Maybe not. All right, fine. But uh, Entry mode. There you go. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, you know the, we've been talking heavy on the hero's journey and the mythology of Star Wars. Let's uh, kind of chill and uh, pull up your seat. Let's uh, let's do a little sentry mode here. Brad, are you ready? I'm ready. Uh, so, just a uh, you know, Ro told me to make these really easy. So uh, he don't want me to embarrass anybody. So I apologize <laughs> if these are too easy for you guys. Is this who's gonna who's gonna answer these ones? Is this, is this four on one? Is that what we're doing here? Let's do 401 and see if we can get uh, some folks in the chat to participate too. All right, sounds good. All right, uh, we got five questions as usual. And the first one of what planet was Count Dooku a member of the royal family? David. Sereno. Sereno. Sereno is the correct answer. That is correct. Excellent. All right, warm up question. Let's, let's go to the real questions. <laughs> All right. Uh, we got a Clone Wars question next. Tup, the clone trooper who had a defective chip and assassinated Jedi Master Tiplar, later said, A good soldier, what? Follows order. David. <laughs> Follows orders, that's right. A good soldier follows orders. All right. How much was Unkar Plot willing to pay for BB-8? 60 pounds. 30 Did I hear a 30? 30, yeah. Oh, see, now I got to say it's wrong. I mean, we had two 60s, but one 30, so I got to... <laughs> we'll divide that. Yeah, 60 portions. I'm only saying he's worth 30, though. Yeah, he's definitely worth more than sixty portion. I don't know how much a portion. We haven't figured out how much a portion is anyway. I don't know. No. Uh, it was a it was a full. It was like package. it was a full package. It was a full yeah. package. So you got one. It, it was split into four. You got one quarter portion was just one little like pizza slice. Yeah. You got the full portion, which was one. Chicago style. You guys, I like getting like one one White Castle burger over four. I don't know. Okay, all right. <laughs> Moving right along. Of what religious group were Cheer Imwe and Bayes Malbus members? Alex. The Guardians of the Wills. Obviously. Nice. And the last one, because I made the first four really easy for you. <laughs> what was Luke Skywalker playing with? And you have to be specific. What was Luke Skywalker playing with while he was talking Skyhopper. with the droids in the Lars Homestead? Rob. Yeah. T-16 Skyhopper. Oh, he's even got the T-16 in there. Well done. It is the T-16 well Skyhopper model. Very well done. Very well done. Thank you very much, Brad, for those questions for Sentry Mode. Thank you guys for joining us here on the Scare of Scuttlebutt podcast. And uh, whoever is left in the chat, please DM us, and I'll send everybody a couple of Scare of Scuttlebutt podcast stickers. I got a nice pile right here. Let's go. DM us. So, uh, again, thank you guys. Woo. Thank you, David, too, for uh, spearheading this and giving us the idea to do this. Uh, Brad, for coming up with the show notes. Rob, Alex, thank you guys so much. And uh, as we usually end this, uh, David, let people know where to find the followers of the Force and what are you guys doing next? Yeah, so you guys can follow us on Twitter at FOTF Podcast. Uh, we just recorded our Last Jedi commentary today. And tomorrow uh, I'll be interviewing Phil Tippett, uh, Academy Award winning stop animator and sculptor, instrumental in uh, the original trilogy, as well as films like Jurassic Park and Starship Troopers. So that's going to be really exciting. We have a slew of other interviews coming up. So it's going to be very, very exciting for the next couple of weeks. I think Alex got has some questions about uh, a certain other movie that. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> Phil Tippett, dude, that's awesome. Congratulations. Thanks, man. Jealous. Oh. And uh, Rob, what is going on over at the Jedi Temple Archives? Yeah, we're uh, we just had our episode this past week, kind of getting everyone ready for what was 
going to be and is already becoming uh, the best portion of Season 7 of The Clone Wars, the Siege of Mandalore. So I uh, kind of did a little background on that, and uh, I'm sure when we get to the next one, I think it's going to be uh, something to prep us for uh, Episodes 11 and 12. But if you're looking for us, you can find us on socials at JTA Podcast. Uh, email us at JTA Podcast at gmail.com. And we also have a uh, voice panel if you want to reach out to us that way at 201-746-JTAP, uh, which is 5827. So drop a message. We'll play it on the show. Excellent. Excellent. And Brad, my co-founder, co-conspirator uh, from the Scare of Scuttlebutt podcast, we, uh, you know, we also have a hotline. I always forget to tell people. We'll let people know that uh, 24-7, if you guys want to leave us, you know, either a review, a complaint, uh, an addition, a little station ID, whatever, a little shout out. It's uh, 773-234-8659, 773-234-8659. Call us 24 hours a day. I don't sleep. Uh, so uh, leave us a message and uh, we'll play it. Uh, on the next podcast and speaking of the next podcast brad we got uh we got another doozy coming up that we're prepping for as well right oh yeah you know we talked about the the mentor early on with the uh the hero's journey and that archetype and uh how much different star wars would have turned out had qui-gon trained anakin for his entire jedi training over obi-wan what kind of character would Anakin have become in that case? Would he have fallen to the dark side? Would he have found that balance? Uh, we're going to talk about all that with a deep dive into uh, Qui-Gon as the mentor. Excellent. We love our deep dives, don't we, Alex? Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of Alex, uh, I know we're both... Hey, that delayed? I can hear it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Three you are. Delayed. That was weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of... Uh, Speaking of Alex, you know, we're both uh, sporting uh, some special shirts. I've got uh, my Salty Nerd podcast shirt, and uh, you guys are uh, doing some really great stuff. A lot of fun listening to the Salty Nerd podcast with uh, you and your team. What do you guys uh, got coming up? Uh, this week we are recording a special episode, uh, the Retro Rewatch. We all picked a different movie um, from the past. I think a couple from the 80s, um, and then I went like Stone Age. I went all the way back to the 60s. Um, <laughs> actually, Age. 1960, actually, with uh, the Angry Red Planet. It was an old space movie about Mars. And uh, we decided just to have some fun because things are slow right now. There's not a lot going on. There's, nobody's going to, uh, to theaters anymore, so it, we're... We're just trying to have some fun and, and come up with some interesting topics. And we wanted to pick some movies that maybe people forgot about or maybe a lot of them maybe haven't even heard of them. So uh, we're going to be sitting down and discussing those movies. We got uh, Escape from New York, um, The Night of the Comet or The Day of the Comet, which is a zombie movie. Uh, Tango and Cash, the uh, uh, Kurt Russell, Sylvester Stallone, and then Angry Red Planet. 1960s space movie so have fun just sit down have a couple of drinks and talk about how far uh cinema has come in those days on in the last couple of decades and how much how much fun it is to go back and watch those old movies you guys can check it out it's on itunes spotify stitcher iHeartRadio, wherever else you might get your podcast and uh, you can follow me on twitter at salty nerd i have all my information in my bio for if you want to buy one of these shirts or um, a couple stickers or whatever, they're all up there. I uh, appreciate it, Road. Thank you. I hope you guys really enjoy the show. Uh, we have, have a lot of fun. It's not so whatsoever. Nothing like this thing. We did around a chance that that kind of brings a little bit of levity and a little bit of fun to uh, to an otherwise uh, a little salty subject sometimes. <laughs> no one did the last Starfighter. No, maybe next time we should do that. That was a good movie too. Get a hold of a couple of Harryhausen uh, stop motion. You know, Jason and the Argonauts. Old some of the old movies. Those are those are pretty cool too. There's a lot there to kind of uh, you know sink our teeth into, uh, but that that's cool. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. Guys in the chat, don't forget to uh, direct message the Scarif Podcast uh, account, and we'll get your information. Some of you guys already have some stickers, but I'm happy to send you guys some more stuff. And uh, like I said, we, we love to give shit away. 
Alex, you usually have the last word, so I'm going to toss it over to you. Uh, say good night to everybody, and uh, I think Frank and Amy uh, beat you to it, but uh, for the most part, <laughs> take it away. Thank you, everybody, for listening to another episode of the Scarif Scuttlebutt podcast, and that's the Scuttlebutt. Excellent. What time is it about you, David? It's got to uh, be it late. is 11.43. Yeah, it's mm. up.